Welcome to our webinar, Discovering Stem Cell Therapies for Vision Restoration. My name is Tom Bruner, and I am the president and CEO of Glaucoma Research Foundation. Today, we will be joined by one of our very talented Schaefer Grant recipients. Glaucoma Research Foundation typically funds eight Schaefer Grants each year. The grants are competitive, $55,000 seed grants for one-year pilot studies, which have led to major advances in the diagnosis and treatment of glaucoma. These one-year grants allow scientists and doctors to do innovative glaucoma research, not normally funded by the National Eye Institute or other agencies. With the data from their one-year Schaefer grants, the scientists can apply and importantly receive major follow-on grants from NEI and other groups. Today's presentation is by our 2021 Schaefer Grant recipient, Dr. June Doe. Dr. Doe is an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the Shiloh Eye Institute, a board-certified ophthalmologist specializing in glaucoma and a clinician scientist. He earned his MD and PhD in neuroscience from the University of California, San Diego, and completed his ophthalmology residency at the University of Southern California, Roski Eye Institute. Dr. Doe did his glaucoma fellowship at the University of California, San Diego, Shiley Eye Institute, and the Hamilton Glaucoma Center. Dr. Doe is an accomplished and dedicated glaucoma clinician scientist working to improve the lives of his patients through his medical care and his innovative research. Please welcome Dr. June Doe. Tom, thank you so much for that introduction. And um, thank you for everyone for attending this webinar. So I'm going to be talking about stem cell therapies for vision restoration. And the way we're going to go about this is we're going to first talk about the challenges in glaucoma and how stem cell research might be applied. We'll talk about some of the stem cell based therapies that we're currently developing at the moment and the challenges and future directions for that research as well. Uh, to first talk about the challenges in glaucoma, we'll first look at the human eye. So this is the eye. It's specialized to be able to perceive light because when light enters the eye, it enters through the pupil here and it hits a structure at the back of the eye called the retina. Um, and this is what your ophthalmologist is looking at when you go to have your examination. Now, the retina can also be thought of as a very thin film or a film that you would normally put in a camera to take photographs with. Uh, because part of the retina, there are specialized cells called retinal ganglion cells. And these retinal ganglion cells are very special because they send the connection that leaves the eye, goes out the optic nerve and into the brain. And so when light hits the retina, that stimulus or that visual stimuli is conducted down the axon or the connection of the retinal ganglion cell, eventually getting to the brain. And the brain takes all that input in and is able to generate a picture. Another way of thinking of these retinal ganglion cells is like the pixel. Uh, a pixel on the TV, a pixel on your camera. Um, the more pixels you have, the more you're able to see. And so in the human eye, there are actually about 1.2 million ganglion cells. And so if you put those all together, you get a picture of the world and uh, what we normally see. What happens with glaucoma is these retinal ganglion cells die or are lost over time. And so uh, glaucoma can progress if it's not treated. And over time, people can lose more and more vision if the progression of glaucoma isn't stopped until eventually that vision loss can be very, very severe. Another way of looking at glaucoma is not only looking at the eye and the retinal ganglion cell, but really focusing on that connection between the retinal ganglion cell here in the eye and the connection that extends all the way into the brain back here on the bottom of the picture here. Now in glaucoma, we believe that the injury occurs very close to the eye and it happens that that injury affects the connection between the retinal ganglion cell and the brain. So you have an injury and you have a loss of that connection. 
that means that in order for there to be rest restoration of vision, you have to regenerate this connection all the way back to the brain. And for a retinal ganglion cell, that's a very long distance. And it's not really able to do that on its own. So the challenges we have in glaucoma, really, um, the two big ones that I see are often that, you know, we have the loss of retinal ganglion cells. So can we really replace those cells and restore that vision? And the other is that connection that we talked about. Can we restore that connection between the retinal ganglion cell and the brain? And I think this is possible. And I think the way that we can do that is with stem cell therapies. And we'll take a step back here and talk about stem cells first. So stem cells are very unique and they come in two flavors really. So there are embryonic or induced stem cells. So embryonic are those that are um, acquired from a fertilized oocyte, so a combination of a sperm. Um, and there are induced stem cells as well. And these can be uh, derived from a uh, person's blood, skin cells. Now there are two unique qualities about stem cells. Uh, one of those is that they're self-renewing. And so you can take a stem cell, you can grow it in culture in the lab, and over time it will replicate and duplicate and won't change the, uh, the state of the cell. So it'll remain the same, but you can get more of them over time. Now, the other property is that these stem cells can become any cell type in the body. And this is what's called pluripotency. So you have your stem cells and they can become cells that are in the liver, in muscle, in kidney, even cartilage. And more importantly, they become neurons as well. And so neurons are basically retinal ganglion cells. So that means we have the potential to make new retinal ganglion cells. Now I have to be um, very straightforward and uh, have a line of caution as well. So there have been cases of these stem cell clinics. Um, now, I believe stem cells have great therapeutic potential, um, but we really need to be cautious about them as well. There are really no therapies with stem cells currently. Um, so you have to be very cautious when you hear about these stem cell clinics. This is actually a patient who went to one of these stem cell clinics, got stem cell injections into both eyes, and actually became blind bilaterally. So I think stem cells, great potential, but at this point, you have to be very cautious and we have to uh, think about being safe for everyone as well. Now, that being said, I think there's great hopes for stem cells, and I'm going to touch on some of those now. And one of those is that first question we ask, can we replace these lost ganglion cells? And so first, we have to make new retinal ganglion cells. And, you know, I've been lucky to work with great colleagues, and some of those have worked with the Glaucoma Research Foundation as well. Um, Derek Wellsby, Carl Wallen, who are both at UCSD. And what we've been able to do together is we've taken cells from an individual, we've treated them with certain factors to be able to make these stem cells. So these are induced pluripotent stem cells. And these are cells that are specific to that individual where we took the blood from. And having done this, we take advantage of the fact that these stem cells can replicate or are self-renewing. And we're able to grow these in the lab so that now we have a, a big source of cells that we can then treat or turn into our retinal ganglion cells. And to turn these into retinal ganglion cells, we take the stem cells, we modify specific genes within the cell. So we have them express certain genes at certain times. Um, and so it's a very organized treatment. And then we're able to actually create new retinal ganglion cells. So simple question, we have these new retinal ganglion cells now. So what happens then if we transplant them into the eye, if we inject them directly into the eye? Um, and part of the trick to doing this is we need to monitor these cells. And so we make them also express a red fluorescent protein. And this is just for um, experimentation purposes only. Um, so this will allow us to follow these cells and see where they go after we inject them into the eye. Now, I told you before that the retina is very thin film, and that's partially true. It is a thin film, but it's a thin film made of three distinct layers. So there's this layer on top designated by the number one, there's this layer in the middle, and this layer at the bottom, number three. Now, where retinal ganglion cells sit is actually in this very top layer, this retinal ganglion cell layer. And 
So that means that new retinal ganglion cells have to get into this layer, and then they have to make these connections to the layers below them. So what happens if we simply take the retinal ganglion cells that we've made in culture and we inject them into the eye? Um, this is an example of, uh, of the picture of the retina here, and this is that cross section that I showed previously. And what you can see here is that we've taken our red retinal ganglion cells, we've injected them into the eye, but they sit on just on the top. They don't really make those connections into those layers beneath the, that first layer, that retinal ganglion cell layer. And that's because there's this darker blue layer here um, that's labeled with laminin. That's actually a barrier that's preventing these cells from getting into the retinal gang or getting into the retina. So we have a barrier. Um, and this is a, an example of a 3D reconstruction of that retina here. So you can see that blue layer, that's the barrier, are red retinal ganglion cells, and they're not really extending anything or moving into those deeper layers. So we have a barrier, let's remove it. And so we devised a way to remove that blue layer, that uh, inner limiting me membrane um, marked by the blue here. And so you'll actually see this example again of a retina where we treated the retina and actually remove that blue barrier. So you can see these openings that we've created here. So we then transplant cells onto the retina where we've done this. And we actually now see that there are red cells that are going into that first layer, that retinal ganglion cell layer. And what's more, they're extending these connections into those deeper layers where they're supposed to go. And this is only about days to weeks after we've transplanted these cells. So in the long scheme of things, this is a very short amount of time, but we're seeing that within that very short amount of time, we're getting the structures that we need to happen for tra uh, retinal transplants to really uh, take place. And this is a reconstruction, 3D reconstruction. So remember what it looked like before where we did not even have these small fibers or these connections. Now we have very long distance um, processes or extensions and connections being made from these cells that we've transplanted into the eye. So I think this is really promising. I mean, it gives us really hope that we can replace retinal ganglion cells that are lost and gets us a step forward to restoring vision in those cases where um, our patients don't have those retinal ganglion cells. Now, the other issue or big challenge in glaucoma is being able to restore those connections, that connection between the retinal ganglion cell and the brain. Um, so how do we restore that? Or so other question might be is, what do we do when, you know, we're not able to uh, plug something in at home where the outlet might be a little too far away? In that case, we usually rely on an extension cord. So is there really an extension cord to the brain? And we've been developing that. We haven't quite called it an extension cord. We're calling it more a stem cell relay. And so in this case, we have that injury, we have that lost connection, and we need that connection to be remade, but it's a very, very long distance, and your retinal ganglion cells normally can't regenerate. They're not like your skin or bone or muscle where they can just regrow these connections. So instead, we transplant special stem cells into the optic nerve, and these special stem cells are able to extend this connection very, very long distances. So we rely on these transplanted stem cells to regenerate that connection. And then our retinal ganglion cells only have to regenerate a very short distance. They connect onto our stem cells. And in doing that, we're able to reform this connection between the eye and the brain. So we, that's, this is theory. And we asked, are we able to really do that? And so, um, and the other thing, or what we've also thought about is, you know, we were able to design the system with this stem cell relay. What are other possible applications? And one other crazy idea is a whole eye transplant, which if you were to transplant the whole eye, you would have to um, transplant the optic nerve and regenerate that nerve. And this is an idea that's been around, um, but I think with this stem cell relay, it may become a reality. So we've been working on this and we've really uh, put a lot of effort and found some very promising results. And we've had to be very systematic about how we look at it. Um, first, we had to look at the retinal ganglion cell connection and whether that connection is being made between our retinal ganglion cell 
and our stem cell relay. So this is an example of what happens when you have an experimental injury to the optic nerve, very similar to glaucoma, where you have an injury to the nerve. So in this case, our retinal ganglion cells and their connections are in green, and our site of injury is marked by this dash line here. So when you have that injury, you have a loss of those green connections on the right side of the injury here. Now, in cases where we've then put in our stem cell relay, we've been able to see that our relays and cells are intact, they survive. And so we're able to see that in red here. And what's more, those axons, those connections between our retinal ganglion cells are extending into our, our graft, our stem cell relay. So that's very promising. Um, so we're making that first connection that needs to be there. And so this is another example of that case where again, you just see those retinal ganglion cell connections, these green fibers here, we see our graft in red, we see where the injury is in blue, and we can really see the overlap that you have these connections growing into that graft. But it's not just that we have those connections growing in, we really have to dissect this down and look at these cellular markers of connections. And one of the ways that we can do that is using these special markers. And so in this case, we're looking at these single cell connections. And so we've labeled the connection from the retinal ganglion cell in green here. Our graft is red, our stem cell relay is red. And we're looking at these proteins, this PSD95, that really sits at these connection sites. And we're seeing that there is overlap between these red green uh, retinal ganglion cell fibers and these white connection sites. So that's, that tells us that these cells are actually making connections with each other. They're not only growing into our stem cell relay, they are actually making connections. We weren't satisfied with just one marker. I think this is a very important uh, topic. And so we looked at other markers as well. Another way to look at this is with this VGLUT2 marker, which is in green. And we've looked at PSE95. In this case, it's this uh, magenta. And when these overlap, they turn white. And so we are seeing that we're actually making these connections between our injured retinal ganglion cells and our stem cell relay. So this is very promising, but really we need to look at this whole system that we're designing here. And so we've looked at the stem cell relay and whether it's really extending those connections all the way down the nerve. And so this is an example of um, an experiment in a rodent where we've grafted those stem cell relays here. And so this is very close to the eye. And you're seeing here, these are extensions or connections that are being extended from that stem cell graft. And we can follow it down the entire length of the optic nerve. And we're seeing that there are connections being extended this entire length of the nerve. And this is only about two to four weeks after transplanting. What happens if we let these stem cell relays go for longer? Because we really do need robust amounts of growth. If we let them go for longer and we look at this structure called the optic chiasm here, which is further down along the length of the nerve, we find that we get very, very robust amounts of growth or connections being uh, made here. And so in this case here, this is that optic chiasm. You're seeing these connections from our uh, stem cell relay. They're going into the chiasm and exiting the chiasm as well. And that's very important. We not only need them to reach the chiasm, we need them to exit the chiasm. We've used other markers as well. And so this is an H tau. And this lets us know that these really are those axons. Um, they're the correct type of connections that need to be made from our stem cell. And that also, uh, I, I neglected to mention, these stem cells are human stem cells. And so we know that these human stem cells are capable of doing this. And this marker is only in human cells. And so it's very, uh, this is very promising but weren't quite satisfied with that. Let's let it go a little bit longer and see if we can really make those connections into the brain. And so we did that and we looked at the brain. Now the connections from the optic nerve and through the chiasm, it's not just a single target that it goes into. There are multiple targets. And the first target that it usually arrives at is something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus or this little region of the brain here. And we've labeled that 
um, that nucleus because it's a collection of cells. And so all these blue or scion uh, uh, markers here, these are all cells within that suprachiasmatic nucleus. And if we were then to look at that and look at the red connections from our stem cell relays um, that you're seeing here, we're seeing that there's quite a bit of overlap and you're seeing innervation. So you're actually getting that connection being made into that first target from the optic nerve. Um, I'd mentioned before that the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that's only the first target. There are many, many more. And so to get to those other targets, uh, connections, uh, our stem cell relay has to extend connections down the optic tract. And so this box here, E, is the optic tract. And we're still seeing very robust amounts of growth. Uh, down that optic tract. So these are connections extending to the further targets into the brain as well. And so I think that's uh, really promising. We're continuing this line of work. And so if we look back then at the challenges that we're facing, whether we can replace retinal ganglion cells, I think that answer is yes, we can really do that with stem cells, being able to differentiate them in culture. Can we restore those connections? I think we're getting to that point as well. Um, I think there's a work to be done still, um, but we're getting there. So really then, what are the challenges that we're doing? Um, well, in those experiments, we're looking at actual restoration of function. So we're testing these animals for behaviors that would let us know that they're able to see um, and that they're responding to visual cues. But we also need to be able to guide these connections as well. And so I showed you just really half of this picture before, but in reality, those retinal ganglion cells, when they extend down the nerve, they have to decide whether to stay on the left side or the right side. And in, in rodents and in rats and mouse, um, most of those actually decusate or cross over to the other side. Whereas in humans, about half of them go one way and half the other way. So we really have to be able to guide the regenerating connections that we create to be able to replicate this so that we can then treat patients with it. Now, the other is that we have to think about the distance that we need to cover with these regenerating connections as well. I've shown you here that we're getting connections from the eye all the way to the brain, but we also have to consider that these are in rodent model. So mouse and rats are commonly what is used. And in the mouse, the connection from the back of the eye to the brain, that's about eight millimeters. In the rat, it's about 20 millimeters or two centimeters. And if we think about the human, that's more about 10 centimeters. And if you're you know, thinking about it, 10 centimeters, not a great distance, pretty short, but for retinal ganglion cells, that is quite a considerable distance. So we really have to be able to show that we can regenerate over these very long distances. And lastly, we've been able to make these retinal ganglion cells, but there's an opportunity there as well for us to make better retinal ganglion cells. The causes of glaucoma sometimes are uh, various. There can be genetic causes for glaucoma, and we can potentially make better retinal ganglion cells by correcting those mutations. We can also correct or gene edit those retinal ganglion cells to help them survive better or extend axons longer. And how we would go about that is with gene editing. And so we've been using very uh, the latest in terms of uh, gene editing tools. So I'm sure many of you heard about CRISPR or Cas9, and that's a way for us to actually target specific genes and edit specific genes. Um, and that'll really be important for us to really achieve those goals that we're looking for. The other method that we're using is viral vectors. And so adeno-associated virus, there's now a gene therapy that's using this virus to correct uh, um, mutations um, in eye pathologies. But we can also use these as a way to express certain proteins or factors to then guide our connections to where we really need them to go. So we can put them into very tar targets that are very far away and pull the uh, regenerating connections that we make to that area. So I think really, I think the, the area of stem cell research in glaucoma is hopeful. I think we're making really strong progress there. 
and you know, I need to acknowledge my collaborators and colleagues. So like Weinreb, Wellsby and Wallen who have really helped with the research and more importantly, the Glaucoma Research Foundation where you know, if you were to approach someone uh, at, at a very early stage in career and say you wanted to make an extension cord for the optic nerve, um, you, you know, they would say that's a crazy idea, but uh, with the belief and the support of the Glaucoma Research Foundation, I think we've really made strong strides in terms of regenerating the optic nerve and potentially restoring vision. So thank you very much. Well, Dr. Doe, that was amazing. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but um, so clear, um, your descriptions and, and your graphics and and the way you explained what you're doing and, and showed the success you've had. Um, uh, really, really amazing and uh, terrific work. And I'm glad that we were able to be there for you with that Schaefer grant and to, to help you as you uh, took on that crazy idea, which now seems to be working. Um, but I wanna uh, thank everyone who's submitted questions and we will certainly do our best to answer them. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to start, I guess, with um, probably what's on a lot of people's minds, which is when do you think this whole process might actually be you know, available to patients? When do you think, you know, is, is this something that's gonna take a hundred years or does it take, uh, since you can grow these new axons in, in, a, in a few weeks, uh, can you, what's your, what's your take on when we might actually see use in humans? Yeah, I think um, there's different applications. I think um, not quite 100 years. I think we'll, we'll be able to achieve it before then. I think, you know, I, I described here two different uh, applications of it. I think here, transplanting the retinal ganglion cells, I think we'll be able to achieve that a much sooner. So I think within uh, decades of that. So I think, you know, we have to figure out how to make those connections, the applications, testings to make sure it's safe. So I think, you know, 10, 20 years, we may be able to get to that point where we're able to transplant retinal ganglion cells and actually apply it. Um, and that will be important because we have to think about the spectrum of glaucoma as well. We have to think about those patients who have very severe disease and those who are more in the mild to moderate stage. And we have to be able to make um, treatments for all of those individuals. Um, so something like the stem cell relay and whole eye transplants, those probably you know, will be longer than the actual retinal ganglion cell transplants. But I think it's worthwhile to pursue because those cases, we can really restore vision, make differences um, to people. So I think not not a hundred years, but I think tens of years will be uh, would be my hope. That's what we're striving for. <laughs> well, and it seems like you've made some real progress being able to get these implanted stem cells to uh, you know connect up in the retina by removing that inner limiting membrane, um, which is done in certain types of uh, retinal surgery already for other reasons. So um, it seems like you've, you've really made some important uh, progress there. Correct, um, yeah. So I think it'll be um, in terms of being able to apply, it, that makes it more applicable. We can translate it much faster. So really the question there then is, can we make those better retinal ganglion cells? Can we get those connections to then leave the eye in the appropriate manner and make those connections to the retina as well? And that's where a lot of our colleagues and uh, teamwork will come in with the gene editing and, um, and collaborations there. Well, and I think you also answered another question um, for us when you talked about making better retinal ganglion cells, because one of one of the questions was, well, why wouldn't the new cells be subject to the same issues that cause the vision loss in the first place? So if, if there's something in, in uh, you know, if glaucoma is causing the loss of the retinal ganglion cells and the loss of the connection to the brain, and you just put new ones back in, won't they also be subject to that problem? But maybe Correct. you could elaborate a little bit on that uh, whole idea, because I, I really like the idea of better RGCs. 
I am, I am uh, I'm all for that. So definitely better is, is the goal here. So, you know, I think it's, it's almost like exactly as you said, we have these retinal ganglion cells. Um, sometimes we know the cause of glaucoma, sometimes we do not. So part of that will be being able to identify in a specific individual what the cause of their glaucoma is. And that's being investigated as well. There's a lot of um, parts within the cell. It could be oxidative stress, it could be the mitochondria. So we really have to be able to tailor that treatment for, for a specific individual. And then we have to correct that within the cell before we're then able to transplant those cells. Um, and then that also leaves that window as well where the, these cells normally, they change the genes that it express over time. Um, you know, when you got a cut when you were much younger, it healed much faster. And then as you got a cut when you're older, you know, sometimes it takes a while. So if we can then revert these retinal ganglion cells to this more, um, you know, younger state, where they're able to grow and make these connections better and then allow them to do that and then turn that off and uh, turn them back into the mature state. You know, those are some genetic tools and cellular tools that we're trying to employ to be able to do that. Well, it is, it is truly amazing what you're able to do today, even just to be able to make retinal ganglion cells from uh, normal blood cells or skin cells or other cells and uh the idea to uh if you could preserve them in their youthful phase and then be able to implant them that would seem like it would be a wonderful way to to have a a, a stronger or more uh, resilient or a greater survival so um another question that i think is also an important one is about clinical trials and so if, if we're going to have something available in 10 or 20 years, when do you think you'll be really ready to start clinical trials in humans? Yeah, I think, um, well, first, uh, we talked about the, the differences that we're seeing in the distance from the back of the eye to the brain. And yes. so I think first, we, you know, the safest thing is probably first to go to larger mammals. And so we have marmoset models, non-humate primate models, and being able to show there that we're able to accomplish this because, you know, that's, you think about it from two centimeters to 10 centimeters for us, not, you know, in our, in our scale, not very significant, but for our, a retinal ganglion cell, it's, it's a considerable difference. So if we can first show this in the um, non-humate primates or marmoset models, then um, we can proceed from there. So I think that probably you know, we could do 10, 20 years. And then from there developing, you know, good clinical practices and good laboratory practices and really making sure that the stem cells that we turn into retinal ganglion cells stay retinal ganglion cells. I think that may be another 10, 20 years after that. So um, I think we'll get there eventually but uh, it'll take a little bit of time. And I think it's worth it because we definitely have to be safe, uh, but we want, we want to achieve those goals as well. Well, and I think, you know, in a way we're still very early in the whole process and, and the tools, if, if you look at the, how quickly the uh, gene editing uh, process, uh, the, I mean, really the development of stem cells is, is a recent event. And now look at what we're doing with it. So um, I think you're, you're being cautious with your timeline, but at the same time, there could be breakthroughs. There could be new knowledge that could accelerate things. So. Uh, uh, oh, I, I definitely agree. And I think, you know, we're so used to iterations of our iPhones now. And so I think there will continue <laughs> to be that, especially with retinal ganglion cells. As we learn more about these cells, we can manipulate them better. Um, and so I think there will be different versions of this. And it's just, um, you know, if you're the type that as an early adopter versus later, I think there will be changes as we learn more about the cells and also our techniques enable and being able to differentiate them and edit them. Yeah. Do you have a feeling for 
when you get into the clinical trial phase is how many people will that require? What, what do you, how do you start? Uh, is it something you need just a few people to begin? Or I know there are the different phases for drugs, for example, mm -hmm. um, to show safety and then efficacy and, and then the larger scale of trials. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think for clinical trials, you know, you have to, I think usually the first metric is safety. Um, so we obviously want efficacy and to be able to show that our transplants are really helping. But first is usually safety. And that's a smaller set of uh, studies. So it's usually about five to 10 patients or individuals who we would do our procedure in and show that it's safe, that it's not causing, um, you know, some of those images that I showed before, hemorrhages or loss of vision in the eye. So I think that's sort of the initial phase of things. And so that's about five or 10 people. Now we also look at those people as well when they undergo that treatment to make sure, and we check and look for uh, restoration of vision. Um, you know, our, our goal is never to cause harm to anyone. And so uh, we, we would usually not want to cause anyone to lose vision as well. So it may be the case that for replacing retinal ganglion cells, we first look at people who have very severe vision loss where, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that would be where any restoration of vision that we have on them could have very significant impacts. And so that would probably be some of the first patients that we're trying to help and that we look at there. Yeah, that was another question is who would be eligible for something like a either a relay as, as you showed, or actually new stems, uh, new ganglion cells. Um, and so uh, probably for those that have just mild vision loss, it would be further downstream. Um, correct, and, correct. And, yeah. and we talked about different versions and applications here. So I think in my mind, the, the stem cell relay, that's probably for the more severe cases. Um, the retinal ganglion cell replacement could also be applied there. Um, something that we did not touch upon uh, in the webinar is something called neural protection. And so, uh, you know, sometimes these, these retinal ganglion cells are sick uh, because the glaucoma causes changes in certain pathways within the cells. And sometimes we can um, address this by protecting those cells. And that might be the case for early glaucoma. Yeah, I think, and as we, as you know, and as I think some of our uh, participants know, there, there is a lot of effort going on as we speak on neuroprotection. And uh, there we are not necessarily having to regrow the connection to the brain. And I think the timeline there is a little more, also a little more optimistic. And there are even um, some very limited clinical trials today on neuroprotection strategies. Um, so that could be, again, another benefit from your research that might come earlier than uh, the full scale eye transplant, let's put it that way. Correct, correct. So it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. Um, we have the early intervention because really we want to prevent people from getting to that severe stage. And so, um, but we need to be able to address um, every wrong, everyone along those pathways. And so that neuroprotection will be very early on, you know, that becomes um, overlap if you're moderate or severe. Um, so really, but prevention is always best if we can do that. But we don't want to forget those people who have very severe disease or sometimes don't even realize they have glaucoma and come in much later uh, where vision is already severely affected. So tell me about um, how do patients get involved in clinical trials? Um, so whether it's a neuroprotection trial or um, a vision, you know, one of the, the trials related to the research you're doing on re replacing retinal ganglion cells, or is there an approach uh, or a way that patients can learn about these trials? Yeah, I think, um, so the trials um, are usually pretty strict in terms of the um, the criteria that patients have to meet. Um, we talked about severity. And so oftentimes, uh, you know, the certain trials are only looking at patients who are 
in the early stages or moderate stages or severe stages. Um, one way to do that is uh, to ask your doctor. Um, you know, sometimes they are involved in recruitment of patients in clinical trials. Um, and this is true for sometimes medications, um, sometimes surgical um, interventions. So those are all um, areas where, uh, you know, as an ophthalmologist, uh, your clinician or surgeon, um, they, some of them do participate or know of people who participate. Um, I think being, uh, there are listings of clinical trials as well. Uh, so there's clinicaltrials.gov. Now, everything right. listed there is not always, um, you know, people can list there, but you know, the regulations uh, need to be very, uh, you need to be very cautious about those. Talk to your doctor if you're thinking about um, enrolling or contacting someone about those as well. Oftentimes those are in certain sites too. And so location does come into play where um, for these uh, clinical trials, it's oftentimes that the patients are being very monitored very closely. Um, and so they're sometimes coming in every month, every two months, every three months. So um, to be part of that study, you would have to be able to fulfill those requirements as well. But, you know, um, I would say, you know, best uh, start is to speak with your physician, make sure that they're aware that you're interested um, and they can definitely um, look for ways to get you enrolled. And, and that might be a very good start. Yeah. Now, are there age restrictions um, for uh, use of stem cells? I mean, would patients of what age patients do you think would be eligible for, for um, implanting new retinal ganglion cells? Yeah, um, I don't think there will be an age restriction. Um, the fact that we can now uh, create stem cells from an individual, that lets us do a lot. And being able to then edit those genes as well, I think that really opens up the um, the age window of when we can actually do that. I think what that question more relates to is um, the, the severity of the glaucoma. So oftentimes, uh, the older patients are those patients who have more severe glaucoma, um, and that might be um, people who may benefit most from it. Um, but I think uh, patients who are younger in age. You know, the so glaucoma is oftentimes not as severe. Now, there are cases where you have very young patients who have very severe glaucoma. Um, but I think if we're thinking about this in terms of the applications of stem cells, most likely it will be in the older patients in the more severe category, whereas in younger patients with less severe glaucoma probably will be the, the neural protection uh, applications there. And what about other uh, various types of glaucoma? Do you think these ideas would be applicable, for example, with exfoliation or traumatic or pigmentary glaucoma? So there, as you, you mentioned earlier, there are different causes of glaucoma. And mm -hmm. I, could you comment on that? Yeah, I think um, with those, uh, I think applicable as well. And though in those cases, we then have to address that additional factor, what really is the cause of the glaucoma. So if the cause is that, uh, like in pseudo exfoliation or pigmentary glaucoma, where the eye pressures are very, very high, we'd first have to address that very high eye pressure. And then we could replace the retinal ganglion cells and, and not allow them to be um, susceptible or uh, 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 have them affected by that very high eye pressure. So I think that becomes more of a, a, a combination and a, not as simple as just replacing what is lost. It's um, kind of looking at what is the root cause of something, addressing that first, and then fixing those things down the line that have been affected by that root cause. And so that would be, I think in those cases, definitely true. Um, I think with the whole eye transplant or the neural relay system that we were talking about, that I think might even have applications beyond glaucoma itself, um, because there are diabetic retinopathies, you know, trauma that causes retinal detachments. And in those cases, the eye itself becomes very disorganized and being able to transplant retinal ganglion cells into a retina that has a lot of scarring or fibrosis or it's even lost the other components of the retina. I, I showed that picture of the retina where it had the three layers. But with retinal ganglion cell replacement, we're really only affecting that one layer. 
So that in some diseases and sometimes in glaucoma, some of those other layers may be changing as well. And so we may need to replace all those layers. And with a whole eye transplant, we're really addressing that. Now, what are the sources of the stem cells? So you mentioned you're using human stem cells now for some of your experimental work. Mm -hmm. But in, in practice, if, if, if this becomes a regular or an approved procedure, let's say an FDA cleared procedure to implant new stem cell, retinal ganglion cells, where would you get the stem cells to, uh, to make those ganglion cells? Yeah. Uh, so that's a really important question. I think, you know, right now the stem cells we're using are human stem cells, and these are um, NIH approved stem cell lines. So these are lines that have already been made. We're not making any new ones here. So the experiments that I showed here, these are NIH cell lines that have been made. Um, and so that's, that's the uh, research that we're doing there. Now, if we're, we're to think of this in terms of applying it to the future, we could uh, take blood cells from individuals who have very severe glaucoma, where we're planning to treat, turn those into stem cells, and then make retinal ganglion cells from them. And mm. th that might, you know, is time intensive and cost, effect, uh, cost intensive as well. You can imagine if we're going to treat everyone with glaucoma to do that for everyone, we could do it but it would take a lot of time and a lot of effort. So there are ways where you can take cells from someone and actually create uh, um, ways to avoid the immune system. Because oftentimes what we're worried about is immune rejection. Um, right. Your body recognizes something as foreign. You know, this is the case in kidney transplants, liver transplants. But if we're able to make these stem cells, we can edit them. And so one of the things we can edit is the ability of the body to actually recognize that cell as foreign. And so in a way, we're cloaking or stealthing our, our stem cells <laughs> and then being able to make those into retinal ganglion cells and transplant them. So that I think with that approach, it'd be much more available for people and less time intensive as well. So just uh, shifting gears a little bit, you did mention the importance of your Schaefer grant. Could you comment on how that grant really have impacted your research progress? Yeah, of course. I think I first approached URF with the idea, um, and you know, this was before I had any preliminary data at all, or some very mild preliminary data. And I think um, you know, really needed the resources to one make these stem cells and transplant them into animals and look at all those connections that were being made. And then I also mentioned the time points as well. You know, we are, we're looking at these animals, not just at a single time point, but multiple time points and being able to do that, um, you know, takes resources. We have to, these are special animals um, um, that we use so that they're not rejecting a human stem cell. Um, there are, I think there was a question about how do we keep these stem cells in place? And so I think the, the we were able to develop um, the, the matrix or, uh, and the supplements uh, that we put in to really allow these stem cells to thrive. Um, and so that's really gone a long way to getting this preliminary data. And it's really helped me along in my career. You know, I've been able to get an NIH grant. I'm currently in the process of applying for a larger NIH grant at the moment. And it really, I think, stems from the Schaefer grant. And, you know, it's really the, the connections that are made as well. Um, I think are, are instrumental and really just having that support and, and knowing that someone uh, has belief in your work and really working towards a goal that you share has been, uh, has been instrumental. Well, and we really have to thank our donors for that because uh, those Schaefer grants uh, um, are the results of, of many wonderful contributions and people that believe in the value of, of research and and the work that you're doing um one other question i and then we probably sh uh, uh should wrap up but i do want to ask you about the impact of stem cell work in other areas of the body not just in the eye is that something that is useful for you i mean do you follow the research and and i'm sure there are other people working on uh in spinal cord injury or other areas with stem cells, is that, how, how has that helped? 
No, that's definitely so. It, it's uh, funny you mentioned spinal cord injury. My, uh, I actually trained with a neurologist at uh, at UCSD, uh, Mark Jasinski, and he works on spinal cord injury. And very similar, um, what we're using here, we're actually adapting from the spinal cord. And so in those cases, you have a spinal cord injury, very similar to uh, the optic nerve where you have an injury, it loses those connections. And so in the spinal cord injury field, they're using this very similar stem cell relay, transplanting those into the spinal cord and having those connections being reformed. And they're seeing, at least in those cases, um, they've done uh, non-human primate models, rodent models, and seeing uh, pa patients or these animals that have um, a spinal cord injury are recovering function. And so they're getting motor function back. And so that's promising. And that brings us a lot of hope because, you know, that lets us know that these are functioning um, when we transplant them into, into animals and it's able to bring back function. So they're working. They're not just making, uh, growing into the right place, but that these connections are actually functional and that they're beneficial. You know, it could be the case that we put these in and it actually uh, doesn't bring back function or makes function worse. But the fact that we're seeing better function, I think is very hopeful. And so I think we're, it's a, I think it's a very promising uh, direction for research and just needs uh, to be developed more, but I think we're getting there. Well, that's um, a wonderful way to conclude, I think, because it, it, the seeing these ideas working is it has to offer a lot of encouragement and hope not only for you for the scientists but certainly for patients uh, and for people who have had to experience vision loss with glaucoma so i do want to thank you very very much dr doe for making time to be with us today for your dedication to glaucoma patients and to glaucoma research and thank you to our participants for your interest and support. If we were unable to answer your question today, please visit our website, www.glaucoma.org, or our many social media platforms for the latest information about glaucoma and our research. Before we conclude, I also want to let you know we, we, we will hold our fifth annual Glaucoma Patient Summit on June 23rd and 24th in Long Beach, California. If you haven't signed up yet, there is still time. Go to our website, www.glaucoma.org summit slash summit or scan the QR code on your screen. We'd love to see you there. It's also a pleasure to introduce our individual and corporate giving officer, Max and Thomas. Glaucoma Research Foundation is headquartered in San Francisco, and Maxon is based in New York City. Please reach out to him to learn more about our research programs and how you can help support them. You will also get the opportunity to meet Maxon and many of our GRF staff at our upcoming Innovations in Glaucoma Forum in Boston on August 16th. Our guest speaker, Dr. David Friedman, is also a clinician scientist and a member of our Glaucoma Research Foundation Research Committee. He will share some of his groundbreaking research glaucoma. More information will be coming soon. Thank you once again for being with us today and for joining us in our bold vision of a future free from glaucoma. Because of your continued partnership, the cure is truly in sight.